uh, working with wholesalers. I, this has been on my to-do list for a while, and I just wanted to um, kind of get some guys up here that could give us some different perspectives. Now, I want this to be open. I don't want this to be a, a lecture. I want you guys to be engaged, to ask questions. Now, I've written, I've already prepared nine or ten questions, if that's all right for you. Um, that I just wanted to ask them and see how they answered. But I want you guys to ask questions of this panel. So with that being said, um, to my immediate right, Marcus, why don't you start us off and tell us who you are, what you do, and who you're with. Hello, everyone. My name is Marcus. I am a regional manager, an assistant regional manager for Net Worth Realty of Dallas. We are a wholesale brokerage uh, based out of Dallas, based out of Texas. Uh, we base. Uh, we have multiple offices: Houston, Galveston, San Antonio, Austin, Atlanta, San Diego, Chicago, um, Tampa. So it's a growing company. Uh, our Dallas office by itself, we buy at least 30 to 40 properties a month buy and sell. Um, there's 16 agents in the office. We all do the same thing: we go out and acquire properties and we present them to you on a silver platter. Uh, we provide you with comps, um, ARV rehab breakdown, rental comps, and also we provide you with funding too. Also. Um, it's no part of the whole process that we don't take care of for you if you choose to. Um, a lot of times when you guys go out and go look at a property, well, I take that back. A lot of times when you guys go search for a property, if you don't have the fund, you have to find hard money. And if you go out to, you know, if you find hard money, the next thing you have to do is go find a property, if you guys catch what I'm saying. We have both. Um, we also provide, again, we have agreements with large companies in the area like Home Depot, so we can provide you also with rehab breakdowns. I can tell you all day, it costs 30 grand to fix a house from, you know, foundation, the roof, plumbing, windows, and things like that. But if we have a reputable company, a third-party company that's not associated with us, that's just walking the house and providing the information to you also, it'll benefit everybody and make you feel more comfortable. Because again, at the end of the day, I'm not a contractor. Um, All right, Marcus, we got it. So, I, I'm sorry, I should have said 30 seconds. I'll be in uh, yeah, I should have, in 30 seconds or less, yes. Introduce yourself. Sorry about that. We're going to get into it, yes, but uh, sorry to cut you off, but yeah, Brian, that, yeah. Hello, my name is Brian Spitz. I'm the owner of Big State Home Buyers. We are one of Houston's largest uh, private wholesaling companies. We just recently opened an office in Dallas. We have a few guys here in the Las Colinas area. We specialize in marketing to people who need to sell inherited properties, divorced, foreclosure, pre-foreclosure. So none of the stuff we have uh, sell hits the market and uh, we sell directly to people like you, first-time investors or long-term investors, and uh, provide the deal that, you know, make you your next uh, rental or rehab. All right, there you go. Zul? Good evening, my name is Zul Budwani. I'm the Senior Vice President for Investable Realty, a brokerage for investors by investors. Uh, for us, we have over 20 agents here in the Dallas area. Our office is located over there off of 635 and 75. Basically, it's very simple, kind of how I mentioned. We're a brokerage for investors, by investors. Majority of our agents are actual investors as well. So we definitely understand whenever a wholesaler brings a deal to us, uh, what the end buyer is looking for, as well as we're a part of our parent company, 2020 REI, and we have our own acquisitions arm that we're disposing of their assets as well. So looking forward to working with you guys. All right, thank you guys so much. So I guess, there you go. All right, so Donna, um, you've got, do you have a watch? Do you have a clock or what, what time are we looking at? I want to see on time. 7.13. 7.13, okay, so we got 20, I'm gonna go 27, no, I'm gonna go 20 minutes. 20 minutes and then I'm gonna open it up. So my first, I've got, if you guys wanna take a picture, Brian, all of these guys are next door um, and their teams and their companies are next door or in the hallway, so Zul, Brian, and I, I'm sorry, Marcus, I had Tony, I know, but it's Marcus, what's your last name? Daniel. Daniels, all right. So Marcus with Net Worth, Brian, and Zul. All right, so Marcus, I'm gonna give you the first question. What's, if you don't mind telling us some secrets, or that's the whole thing is, how are you finding most of your deals? I think it's really no secret sauce to, you know, going out there finding deals. I think that the biggest thing that worked for us, I think, is to have so many agents, and there's multiple ways to do it. One, I mean, you can, uh, we pull them from probate attorneys. Uh, we go knock on the doors. We pull from other agents. We pull from other investors and things like that. So it's nothing that's, just say per se, secret. 
it's something out here I think all the guys do. I just think that we just do a large amount of it. We just do a lot of it, whatever it is. Like I said, we do a lot of door knocking. Um, talking to a lot of investors. Um, yeah, you talk to a lot of realtors, going to Bell Bondsman. I mean, they have houses. So just multiple ways, you sometimes just have to think outside the box. And whatever it is, whatever path it is, we just do it extra. So, gotcha. All right. Brian, what about you? Uh, our specialty is internet marketing. So we've done internet marketing since um, before a lot of people got into it. So that's our primary source, both pay-per-click ads, video advertisement, uh, SEO marketing, social media marketing. So. Uh, just reaching out to people who are searching to sell their properties. Um, that's, I'd, I'd say that's about where 75% of our properties come from. Gotcha. So how long, just kind of a secondary question on that is, you know, the nurturing, I mean, you're not doing organic. You spend a lot of money on pay-per-click ads. And that's one thing, that's, all of us could do that, right? We're probably not gonna be where you're at anytime soon, or willing to spend probably what you're spending on a monthly basis. Our pay-per-click budget between Houston and Dallas is 70,000 a month, so it's a, it's a pretty hefty spend. Um, it's very sophisticated pay-per-click marketing, uh, but we do a lot of organic uh, marketing as well. So we've done it since 2008, so we have a, a pretty good ranking uh, with Google, and our website's over 500 pages, um, so it doesn't look that lengthy if you look at it, but it's, uh, that's, that's my specialty is internet marketing. It's a very interesting business, hard, hard to compete with. Hard to yeah. compete with. Cool. Zul, what about you? Are you marketing properties uh, to us, or are you marketing going out and seeking properties? The bulk of our spend and effort is in reaching sellers. So uh, we also have a buyer's website. It's called Big State House Deals. And that's where we post the properties for sale and send to our buyer's list. And, and that one is more word of mouth. But the bulk of our effort is to reaching sellers. And, and just to interject, um, I'm going to repeat the question so everybody can hear. So the question was, is the bulk of the $70,000 per month going towards attracting buyers or sellers? And you heard Brian's answer. Zul, tell me about finding deals for investable H&R under the 2020 umbrella. Sure. So as you mentioned, um, we go through our parent company, 2020 REI. Under the umbrella, there's H&R acquisitions, which provides 50% of our deals. The other 50% is divided into pretty much two ways. One, we have a very large network of wholesalers uh, throughout Dallas and Fort Worth that hire us to market their deals. And also, we have pretty good organic leads as well, too, just folks that, you know, typical investors that's had the house for some time is now looking to move to a different asset class. Cool. Um, the next is pre-qualification. I, I get a lot of, I get a lot of um, new investors that always ask me, should I work with wholesalers, right? That's my, you know, they, I've heard about net worth, I've heard about big state, and should I work with them? I guess my question is, and I always, my short answer is absolutely. You should absolutely, if someone's gonna bring you deals, you should look at their deals. Now you might not always agree with their valuation, but you should at least look at them. If they're sourcing deals in your price points, in your areas, you should look. If I wanted to work with you guys, what, what's the prequal? How, much, how many hoops do I have to spend a week with you guys in training sessions? What's the pre-qualification process, Marcus? <sighs> Proof of funds. Proof of funds is probably the biggest thing, qualification, um, just to be upfront and honest with you. Uh, if you're looking to use hard money, of course, it's going to be some standard things like base statements, uh, 1099s, thing, or tax returns. Um, that's just one step of it, but uh, I think that's the most simplest way. I mean, with any real estate transaction, you will have to provide proof of funds regardless, no matter who it is, not just net worth, big state, and feasible. It's going to be yeah. real to next door. It doesn't matter. Brian, what about you? Is there anything other than proof of funds that you're going to need from me? I mean, are you going to look at my track record, or do you really care if I bought one house or 100 houses? No, we don't care. I mean, we because our marketing is so focused on the seller, our, you know, we really consider ourselves as a, our reputation on the, on the line when we promise a seller that we're going to get a deal closed. So we really want to vet that you know what you're going to do with the house and that you do have the means to close it and that you understand the remodel and and all that process. We work with a lot of first time home buyers because that, you know, helps us build relationships. Um, you know, but you know, really a lot of it's very subjective. We've, we've all done it for a long time. So we know what questions to ask to make sure that you, you know what you're getting into. Gotcha. 
Um, it, as far as, well, if we have proof of funds, that's, you, you've accomplished your goal, which is to fund the, the contract that you wrote. Um, Zul, talk to me about, are there any other services that Investable offers you know, besides the pre-qualification process. I mean, if I came to you and said, look, I've got some money, I, I, I've heard of you guys, how do I work with you? And can you give me a 30 second overview of what you would do? Sure, so I mean, if you're a first time investor, I'm guessing that's what we're kind of going at here. Yeah. Um, for first time investors, we definitely offer, you know, just a, con a consultation. We're pretty much trying to understand what you're trying to do. Everybody wants to fix and flip because they watch HGTV and they saw the property brothers do it and woohoo, we can do it too. That's cute. But at the end of the day, I mean, at the, you know, are you ready to transact? One, do you have the means? Two, do you have the team behind you? Team being your general contractors, subcontractors. And lastly, do you have the ability to do it? We really evaluate that process. Because at the end of the day, look, it's fun to watch HGTV. I watch it with my wife. It's really fun. But are you truly ready to do it? That's what we're really looking for. We're looking for folks that are ready to go out there and actually pull the trigger. Uh, Roddy asked a great question. How many people wrote a contract today? And only three people raised their hand. We're really hoping for most in the room to raise your hand. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for active buyers that are ready to pull the trigger. Question. Yeah, I'm going to go back to Brian. Besides proof of funds, where's the proof of funds? All right, so let me, let me just um, state this. So you're looking for additional questions besides proof of funds. What questions does Brian or the panel ask prospective buyers? I want to know what you're going to do with the house. I mean, it's not the, my business, but you know, if you're going to look at flipping a house that's at 80, you know, 85 cents on the dollar that's really meant to be a rental, then I'm not going to tell you not to do that, but at least we'll show you the numbers and want to make sure that you know, you know, what we think the best course of action is. Because uh, you know, I do both. I, I'm own my own rental portfolio. I flip houses. I wholesale. I've done pretty much everything you can do in this business. So uh, we want you to be successful at it. We're not going to stop people from buying our properties, but um, you know, and we don't do bidding wars or anything like that. We just want a qualified person who is excited about a transaction and has the ability to close it. Uh, like I said, it's it's kind of subjective. I just you know want to know that you're serious. All right, Zul, this one's for you. Valuations. This is kind of where we get a sticking point. Everybody has an opinion on what the property is worth and then rehab value. So kind of give us, you know, what's your, I guess my question is, I'll see a wholesale deal where it has a, a sold comp that's two miles away where there were three comps that were in the area. So what's your, what's your stance on that? And I'd like to get your, your take on all that um, as far as evaluating and what comps are you showing us versus which ones you're not? Sure. Um, so I mean, kind of what Marcus said, there's really no secret sauce. I think we all kind of use similar um, analytics. Uh, but for us at, Invest at Investable Realty, primarily we're looking for comps similar in make, build, and year. So if it's a 322, we're comparing it through a 322. If it's a 1980s build, we're not going you know, anything lower than that. We try to keep it as close to the subject property as possible. Uh, same thing in square footage, ideally 20% plus minus. You don't want a 1,400 square foot house being compared to a 2,400 square foot house. Uh, lots of folks, you know, they see, oh, something sold for 300,000, that's my comp. Well, the thing that sold for 300,000 might be a 4-3 with a pool, while your house is a 3-2 with no pool. Pool. So it just really depends. So we really try to do an apples to apples comparison. And even though apples and tomatoes look alike in color, they're not the same thing. Brian, is there anything that you'd like to kind of add to that as far as going across major streets and boundaries? What's your take on that? I, I've always, and you know, what do we do? I'm a, I mean, I'm a moderator, so I'm trying to get your perspective on I mean, using comps that were close in size, but maybe in a different subject prop or subdivision. Well, we all, I, I mean, I teach the guys to comp by first starting in the subdivision. If you can pull plenty of comps within the same subdivision, we stick to that. Um, and, you know, within the same decade, within 10 to 20 percent of square footage. Um, some of the guys that work for me that are agents like that price per foot a lot. I mean, I'll look at that. I'll look at price per foot. We'll look at what the lowest. I like to look at what ours is relative to the lowest 
possible price on the MLS. So if you had $100,000 and you were going to the MLS in this area, what could you buy? And then how does ours price relative to that? Because we want it to be a better deal than you can get on the MLS. But as far as you know, value goes, I mean, it really only comes up in in rural areas or, or off, you know, you know, off areas where you have to go outside the subdivision to pull comps. Um, but I mean, there's, you know, it's such a tight market. You have to evaluate things as rentals, as flips, you know, relative to foreclosure prices, you know, highest sales with the market doing the last three months, what it doing the last year. I mean, we, we, we pull comps three or four different ways before we come up with a value. Gotcha. Cool. Marcus, talk to me about closing cost. <laughs> How, you know, in most cases, sometimes I've heard of the word simultaneous closes, double closes, assignments. Right. Right. You know, those, those are all three words that I want to kind of define. Um, an assignment versus simultaneous versus a double. So talk to me how you guys work when it comes to, do you do all three? Do you just cater to one? Talk to me about closing costs. Because at the end of the day, investors, are we're looking at our bottom line. Correct, right? correct. <laughs> We strictly do double closes, um, no assignments whatsoever. Uh, any costs that occur to us on that front side when we purchase a transaction, all our transactions are A to B, A to B, B to C transactions. So that means, say for example, George, you would be the seller. We would purchase it, and I would sell it to Brian. Any costs that occur to us when we purchase the house from from George, we would pass that along to our buyer, dollar for dollar. This is not a cost that's coming from us. That's you know that we're marking it up and making it part of our fee. That's not what it is. It's simply just the cost that's passed us from the title company, such as title policy, you know, doc, doc prep fee, recording fees, and things like that. So it is, it is with us, you're paying slightly more, but it just really is, honestly, it's just really the cost of doing business. Uh, we make our money more or less off volume than we do off of, you know, trying to smack large fees, you know? Gotcha. So um, I don't know where I was going to go with that. Brian, I'd like to know what you guys, if you don't mind, do you assignment simultaneous or double? Yeah, we do almost exclusively assignments. So what we do is we assign you the interest. Uh, you're basically buying the right to be big state home buyers in the contract. So whatever closing costs we've promised to the seller, which are usually title policy and escrow fees, are passed along. So there's you know one set of closing costs. Uh, we do always make sure the buyers are responsible. The sellers are always responsible for their prorated taxes and any legal issues that have to be settled through affidavits of airship or anything like that. Gotcha. Um, you know we do. A double closing once in a blue moon. The truth is, is it's a lot messier for taxes for me. So I actually prefer not to double close properties. All right. You have someone with a question over there. Yes. All right. So asking me so the question was is is and this is for the panel is the price negotiable because the investor that you're marketing to doesn't agree with either your price or your rehab and in this case it was the rehab so Brian he asked it to you first but I'll let everybody is it usually negotiable I think I know the answer but um, uh, let's see what you say is the price. He's asking, price. Brian has offered the property for $100,000. This gentleman wants to pay ninety, or dollars Right. Yeah. There you go. You know, it's uh, the law of supply and demand, so it depends on, you know, I mean, <laughs> no, nothing's negotiable unless I don't have anybody else paying the price that we're asking for it, and then of course it's negotiable. But, um, you know, we try to be thorough with the repair estimates and, and consider the foundation and consider all of those things. You know, we give you an estimate that's usually within 10% of what we think the remodel budget will be. And, um, you know, you're not going to find us saying it's 15 if it's really 40, but uh, unless we've just, you know. 
Yeah. yeah. Unless we just, you know, didn't pay any attention when we were out there. But, you know, things are negotiable as far as what someone's willing to pay for something. So I would encourage you to look at a house and make an offer, if that's your question. And then, you know, we'll know the individual seller's circumstance, whether or not they have more room to go down. Okay, let me do this. Let me ask you a question. Is that pretty much your answer as well, Marcus? I don't want to put words in you. Zul, okay, so everything's negotiable. I guess my next follow-up question is, how often, not to get too deep in here, but Marcus, how often do you take less than what you offer in this market right now? Not often, it's a very, very aggressive market. Um, you know, luckily we do a, enough due diligence before we put the property out, such as get a foundation bid. It's hard to command top dollar if you don't have enough information to make people pay top dollar. That's all to it. Um, so it doesn't happen often. Let's just say every 45 deals, we may have to take less than normal. Um, most of our deals, I know they sell within the first 24 to 48 hours, and if they don't, then we know it's something that's missing on it. Um, and like Brian said, I mean, normally with the rehab, it should be uh, give or take 10% variance. Um, so I'm just long, no, we're not, we don't. Zul, what about you? Are you pretty much, when you make an offer, I know we've done some deals, Elevate some, done some deals, and, and you know, sometimes I don't jive and you're like, it is what it is, right? Kind of what Marcus said, we, you know, again, we're also investors, so we do our best to do the thorough due diligence for our clients. But at the same time, I mean, it's the law of supply and demand, right? I mean, if no one else is offering on it and your offer's close enough, we'll take it. But we don't do highest and best. We don't call for best offer. It's simple. We have a price out there. We find the person that pays for it or comes near it. We pretty much do the deal. Uh, this isn't the market like the MLS where we're all asking for highest and best by Sunday at 5 p.m. Randy in the back, you had a question. So the question is, why is it getting bid up? You're marketing some, you know, I think I know the answer, but you're marketing the property and you blast it out to me in the morning. I go out there at two o'clock for the open house and I get there and there, it's already at 112. So a real quick short answer. I think I know it's supply and demand, Randy, but why do you, you know, Marcus, yeah, Brian, you say it and then Marcus and Zul. I'm gonna tell you all a secret. In Houston, we are uh, we are the largest wholesaler in Houston. In Dallas, we are new. This is a new market for us. So, this guy right here, Cameron, is my uh, team lead here, and he's got two other guys. So, you are probably going to get make a better deal with me right now because I'm newer in the marketplace. So, make sure to get their cards. But as far as answering that question goes, um, we take we write down the order in which people call about a deal and then we'll limit the showing to a certain number of people and then we'll schedule a second showing if it doesn't sell on the first and we sell it, I mean our max price is the price that we're asking. And so we order, we, we offer it in the order of which people inquired about the house, not necessarily the, when they saw it, if, as long as they saw it the same day. Zul, what about you? How could you, Marcus? Ours is similar. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Ours is similar to uh, exactly what he said, but at the same time, again, this is not the market where we're asking for highest and best. You know, uh, we typically have a showing day, the first, you know, five, ten investors that show up. The first one to deliver earnest money check is their house, the price that we have it at. We're not, you know, calling for highest and best. So if you deliver the price that we have, it's your house. If you don't deliver the price that we have, we are going to wait for the price that we have. And if we don't have it, then it's yours as well. Marcus, what about you? How's the net worth one? It's the exact same thing. If we have 12 investors at a house, which it happens often, what we normally do, just simply draw a name out of a hat. We'll take everybody's card. They have a business card or we'll do a coin flip or something like that. Uh, we don't believe in bidding up properties just because of the fact the margins, and I think you guys would agree, the margins are already tight enough as it is. Um, so it doesn't make any sense to, you know, you get there and it's 100, you know, it's 100 grand on a the flyer, then when you get out there, it's 112. Um, that's just not that's just not our business our business model. That's not something that we do. Talk to me, Zul. You yes, you, and this is your last question, ma'am. You get two free questions. And this.
improvements with your repair estimates and do you provide your investors with repair estimate sheets proof of your contract loan? Okay, so I, I, I missed the first half, but you're asking, are you giving a repair breakdown estimate? So, Zul, um, that mic, let's pass that, Marcus, let's pass that down. That, it's giving us too much feedback, so. Uh, typically, we do provide GC budgets, but at the same time, it depends on your end goal. If you're fixing and flipping, you might want to spend a little bit more. If you're buying and holding, you might want to spend a little bit less. So it all depends on your exit strategy. So we do like to review what your exit strategy is, and from there, we can kind of give you a better understanding instead of just giving a, you know, a generic number that, hey, this is what it is. Even though most of us do give generic numbers, and we'll pretty much specify that if we think it's a buy and hold or a fix and flip for that specific house. Brian? Uh, my guys have a checklist that they use when they inspect the property that uh, links up with the, my own checklist for when I renovate properties. Um, there's a few things that we consider, things like if the house, you know, is older than a certain age and has foundation problems, we always budget $6,000 to replumb, you know, the under, underground plumbing regardless of what we see. So there's a few things that we always factor in. But, um, you know, the repair budgets are accurate. You know, within five grand or so, five, six thousand, they're not, you know, we're not giving you a repair budget of $25,773. I mean, we don't have a contractor that goes through it, but my guys do see hundred, you know, hundreds of houses a year. So, you know, we do the best we can. It's not perfect, but it's close. Marcus, what about you? Uh, we use multiple companies. Um, you know, obviously with us walking the property, a lot of our acquisition agents, you know, they have experience, years and years of experience of walking houses, but at the end of the day, we're not contractors. So what we do, we use companies, like I said again, like when I said uh, earlier, in the, uh, earlier, we use companies like Home Depot. We would go out there and we have them give, give us a full-fledged bid from beginning to end, paint, carpet, flooring, things like that, and we will put it in the packet. We will put it in the packet. Um, obviously, if it's just paint and carpet and things like that, I mean, I mean, you, you should know, you should know it, but obviously with you guys being new, you know, obviously it's going to, you know, you guys won't, but we do get full-fledged bids, multiple companies that we use, uh, just a competitive, you can bring your own GC if you want, we're happy with that, um, so we just want to make sure that you're comfortable and you have all the information that's needed when you purchase the property. Got it. Talk to me about earnest money, real quick, what's your requirement on earnest money, I'm there at the house, I like the house. I might not have the check on me, and, you know, I mean, you I'm new, you don't know me, so t talk to me about that. Uh, any property that you buy is going to be at least a 5K deposit going to the holding company, which is Dallas Metro Holdings for Net Worth Realty. Um, that's to lock it in. Uh, we, it's non-refundable, um, unless there's some kind of issues with title or anything like that, or it's, it, it's just some issues that we're, able, you know, we're not able to close and we will give that money back. But it is a five grand deposit along with signing a contract before you lock up any deal with us. Brian? It's the same, $5,000 that's refundable if and only if we can't provide clear title within. And, and then do I make that check out to you, the title company? It goes to big state home buyers. So, okay. Um, so if I see you in Tahiti on Facebook, I shouldn't worry after I gave you 5000 No, because if, if your $5,000 check is sending me to Tahiti, then my cost of doing business is way too low. Okay, gotcha. Zul, what's it going to take? 3000 up to the first 100000 and then from there we add an additional 2000 per 100 So if it's a $200,000 deal, then expect to bring five, 300 expect to bring seven. And typically we will either take it to the title company or to the company that's wholesaling it out. All right. Talk to me about cash versus hard money. Um, and Brian, this doesn't, but I've heard some wholesalers, hey, if you use cash, you know, we're, we're really looking for people that can, I don't want to say double dip, but net worth has a hard money. Uh, there's lots of wholesalers that are now having two companies, right? They have a hard money and a wholesaling business. So is there any weight to that? If I came to you and said, look, I'm cash. I don't need a hard money lender, Marcus. Am I going to be play second fiddle? You're not going to be placed second fiddle. We'll just try to explain to you the process. If you have cash, that's great. Um, but the cash that you let, let the cash leverage you more properties. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Instead of you having 200,000 buying one house, take that same 200,000 and buy seven houses. Gotcha. You know, let it, use it as a leverage. You're going to educate me on, look, you can buy more deals. You can buy way more two. deals. And I get this point, you know, the points and the interest is kind of pricey. But at the same time, you know, you don't, you have to look at it as using other people money. And I think all you guys in here have looked at Red Robert Kiyosaki and Donald Trump, 
and everything like that as far as speaking about leveraging other people's money. And hard money gives you the opportunity to go out there. It's asset based. It's not really based off of you know, the person is more or less based off the property. They're going to look at some financials just to make sure that you're able to float the loan because, I mean, that's important. I don't think you guys will lend somebody money if they're not able to pay you back. Gotcha. Um, it, it, it just works way better. It flows better. It gives you opportunities, way more opportunities to be able to tackle more rental properties, tackle more flips, using less of your capital. Okay. So not to put you on the spot, but am I going to see every deal even though I'm a cash buyer? Meaning... Meaning, if I say, hey, I don't want your hard money, I want to buy, you're going to show me every deal that net worth has, correct? Okay. But some of the deals, well, let me take that back. We will show you every deal. Yeah. But a lot of our deals, we, with that 212, we will place a 212 rule on it. That's the name of our hard money company. Within the first, you can look at it as a VIP list. Within the first 24 to 48 hours, however we want to mark it up, um, it would be only exclusive to our hard money people. That's it. That's it. So the people that's using our hard money can purchase the property. And it only happened on deals that's very hot, you know, below the ARV, below the 80%. Um, could be somewhere like an Allen, Plano, North Dallas. You know, it's a strong flip. And the numbers totally make sense. And the good thing is you don't, I mean, you can use the minimum and you can refinance the next day. You can purchase the property using a hard money minimum of $50,000 and then refinance out the next day with no penalty. We see people do that a lot of times. They just want to get the deal before anybody else. Um, you can become an investor in, you know, in the 212 fund. So, you know, on top of that, you won't even have, you don't, you know, you have money, you're getting a 10% return annually, mm -hmm. and you're able to circumvent that and still buy the property cash. So if you have that much cash, you ha there's ways around and there's ways that we will work with you as far as being able to purchase the property. Gotcha. Brian, I think I know the answer. Are you, there isn't, um, well, I don't want to answer for you, so. Hey, you do. Oh. <laughs> um. I mean, cash. There's no hard money with you. You're doing all no, the No, we don't provide right? the hard money. We have preferred hard money vendors or lenders that we use um, more than anything else because I know that they know what they're doing and they'll close the deal. So, you know, and if you're going to use hard money, then we're even more interested in making sure that you have proof of funds that you can, you know, because you're going to bring money to closing. I mean, it's, there's no 100% financing, you know, at in this prices game, yeah. in this market. Right. So, you know, if you have hard money, we want to make sure you have the ability to bridge the difference. Cool. Zul? It's uh, all fair game, really. Um, whether you use hard money or you use cash, we pretty much have a distribution list. If you sign up for our distribution list, you'll get the deal. It's kind of the same thing what Brian said. If you are using hard money, we want to know who your hard money lender is. We are going to call your hard money lender, and we're going to confirm that you are ready to play. All right, Zul, staying with you, last question. Biggest mistake you see new investors make? Is there's one? Is there, if, if if you can put, if I were coming to you, or what would you say, George? Make sure you don't do this. I, I personally think just rehab. You know, I I think it's just it's it's scary to new investors. So I, I personally feel rehab is the biggest mistake you can make or break your deal in rehab. You know, um, and I don't mean it by that you're not budging it right on the buy side. I mean it as you're doing the deal. You get emotionally involved in the deal. If I lived here, mm -hmm. I would want this. You're not living there. This is this is a this is a business decision. Just so you take over the emotion improve. out of it. Yeah. Take the emotion out of it. Just do it like a business deal. What makes you money? Do it like that. Brian, any words of wisdom that you could give us? Same. Uh, over improving the property, but then again, from a you know repair estimate, make sure you're looking at things like fencing and landscaping and plumbing and electric service panels and you know we're going to point this stuff out to you but it's real easy to miss you know the concrete in the back patio or the driveway i mean does it need to be replaced just missing the there's big ticket items that you know are easy to glaze over so um over improving the stuff that doesn't count and then not fixing the stuff that you need to fix marcus anything yeah, it's just really not knowing the market. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing. I mean, obviously, I think you should do your own due diligence, learn the market. I mean, it is investing. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing. And even I made that mistake when I, bur when I bought my first house 10 years ago, my first flip. Um, I mean, all, we can tell you what it's worth. Anybody can tell you what it's worth. But I think people overall need to do their own research and understand what they're buying. Look at the rehab. Do it. Look at it for yourself. Look at the numbers. Call a realtor. Look at a third party. You know, just look for third parties if you can. I mean, the deals, the strong deals, a lot of strong deals that come out from a lot of wholesales, not just us, but other companies, other people. But it doesn't hurt to take the time to look at the information yourself. 
It doesn't. It doesn't. I think that's where a lot of investors, uh, new investors, fail because only take one house to take you under. Yeah. Yeah. Only, only and take it one. takes one house can one house yeah. can do you in. Trust yeah. me. Um, it's almost like having a kid. I think you know. You try to explain to somebody what it's like to have a kid mm -hmm. that don't have a kid. Right. It's hard to explain that to them. So, and I think that a lot of people need to realize that when you when you stepping into it, do your own due diligence. Definitely do that and know the market. Understand it. I can't say it enough, like understand what you're buying, understand values. Don't overdo the property. Don't get your emotions in. Right. Well, guys, I can't thank you enough. Is there any other questions? We're going to wrap this up. Yes, sir. So a couple months ago, we talked about the specifically direct mail. Uh, I had a number of people that I was curious to direct mail and what the response So the question was direct mail conversion rates or response rates? It varies, depends on what you use. I know me, myself, I like yellow letters um, and postcards. I mean, some people use more of a corporate look. Well, um, I know our office, you know, they prefer as far as using more of a corporate look. Me, myself, personally, um, if I send out a thousand letters, which is really, really low and I don't, but when I started off, I would probably send out a thousand letters. Uh, probably get, I don't know, 10 to 15 calls and get one deal out of that. Um, so that's, that, that's a normal rate. I feel comfortable putting, I would say one, if you send out 1,000 letter of postcards, you should be able to get one deal if you really work it the way you're supposed to. Um, obviously, I think to get more of a volume of call flow, I would say probably, I don't know, 25 to 4,000, you know, starting off. Um, you, sh you, sh you should be able to double that, you know, but I think, I think that's a safe number. Brian, I know you do a lot of internet, so. Yeah, I did direct mail in the beginning. That's not my favorite. Um, when I did direct, if I were doing direct mail, I would use the invitation envelopes and handwritten letters, and I would probably uh, be sending to people going into tax foreclosure because they're less likely to have a mortgage. So if, if I were doing direct mail, that's probably what I would do, but I don't. So they got, you got not only what, but the lead type. There you go. Zool? Um, our parent, uh, you know, in our parent company, 2020, H&R Acquisitions, uh, they've been using postcards for over a decade, and it works for them. So, um, but again, the conversion rate is right around one to two percent. I wouldn't say it's any better than anyone else's. So, it just depends on what your niche is and what you prefer. All right, guys. Hey, y'all, put your hands together for Marcus, Brian, and Zool.